All right, so we're just waiting for everybody to get back in the room. Um, we are recording, and then I will jump into my um, to my notes. All right, so we're back. Okay, so um, before I jump into my notes, are there anyone that has questions or points of clarification, um, terminology that you'd like to have clarified before we get into the material? There was a part a part in the poet in the poem where it has French in it. I believe it's French. What what's the term or what page was the term? Uh, it's page seven, the fourth paragraph. It's it opens with the French. We were just talking about it in our group as if we don't know like what it means. We assume that it meant a salute to the ocean. Yeah, something it looks like also veil maybe. I, that I'm not sure. Um, and I didn't, I never looked it up either. I was kind of skimmed past that, but that's, that's a good question uh, that I do not have an answer for. Um, but this does kind of get to a point of my notes. Is, is another question? I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Oh, no, I didn't have another one. Sorry. All right. Um, so what I'll do then, if there's no other questions, I'll jump into my notes and it kind of addresses some of these things. Um, I know for me, when, I, when I'm engaging a new thinker, when I'm engaging a new scholar, I always kind of like to know a little bit about that scholar's background. Um, so I'm going to share my screen real quick, give you guys some real brief information about um, Edward Glissant. He is a Martinican poet. Uh, he made his transition in 2011. Um, although he was born in Martinique, he is trained in intellectually in France. So he does have a large uh, French background. Uh, he deals with notions of migration, of diasporic um, relations, and just this notion of relation becomes a very part um, important aspect of his work. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about Glissant. Um, I, okay, so that's the translation, Alexis. I greet you, Old Ocean. Yeah, I just Google translated it. I don't know how accurate Google Translate is, but that's what it says that it translates to. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. I don't have any other information or anything else to re rebuttal that. So I will take that as, as face value. Um, thank you for that. Um, so the, the text is titled Poetics of Relation. And, and again, this notion of relation becomes important. And we'll um, get into that as we go deeper into our conversation. So let me get back to my notes. Um, so the text, as Alexis points out, um, it was originally published in French. Uh, it was translated to English by Betsy Wing, um, who was a, a scholar out of uh, the University of Michigan. Um, the publication took place in 1997, so this came out in 97. Um, for me, another thing I also did was look up poetic to kind of give myself a better understanding of what is a poetic. Um, so the, the dictionary defines poetic as relating to or used in poetry, having an imaginative or sensitively emotional style of expression, right? So that's how the dictionary des defines the poetic. Um, for me, another way I think about a poetic is merging a poem and an essay, right? So you may deal with the um, intellectual queries or the intellectual questions of an essay but you can have the flexibility to play with the language and manipulate the language in a form that could be poetic or, or poetry-like, right? So that's a, another way that I think about the poetic. Um, another thing about this text that becomes interesting that you don't see in a lot of intellectual texts, it provides you with a glossary. Um, I believe the glossary is provided for uh, two reasons. Um, one, it is a translated text, right? So there's some things that may get lost. And then also, um, he's dealing with this notion of creolization. So there's also um, words that may be in Creole that you will not be able to find in the dictionary. So that glossary serves as another tool to provide you um, insight. Um, one of the first words that I looked up or was able to locate within the glossary, um, and it's on, page, it's on the opening page, um, in the middle of this paragraph here, the sentence starts with um, exile can be, I'm sorry, the, se the, the sentence starts with the second. The second dark of night fell as tortures and the deterioration of person. The result of so many incredible genas, and genas is the word that's provided the definition in the glossary, and they define gena, gena as a hell, a place of fiery torment, right? So when you hear that, just think about hell 
right? So if I read the sentence again now, understanding what genas are, um, the second dark of night fell as tortures and the deterioration of person, the result of so many incredible genas or incredible hells, right? So um, that's one insight that's provided by the glossary that you guys did not have access to. Um, but I wanted to provide you some, some of those definitions. Um, also, as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm attentive to the fact that Glissant is doing something with terms like the shadow, um, terms like the abyss, in terms like darkness, right? Um, for those, I don't know how many of you guys um, read plays, but for people who are familiar with plays, right? Like darkness could be a character with, within, its, within the play itself, right? And to me, this, um, this kind of serves the same way. The, the, the darkness that Gleason is talking about could serve almost as a character, right? So I'm attentive to how he's using that and how the darkness and the abyss move and the shadows move throughout the poetic. Um, okay. Um, did anybody, so on the opening paragraph or the opening three lines here, um, after the word Americas, you have a comma and then a little star or an asterisk. So it opens with, for the Africans who live through the experience of deportation to the Americas, comma, then the asterisk. I don't know if you guys were aware of that was an indicator of an end note. And if you follow that asterisk to the bottom of your page here, you can see that same asterisk to start this uh, paragraph at the very bottom. So what that is telling you is after Americas, there's more detail that the author is providing you at the end of the page to give you more context for what he's trying to explain. Did anybody read that portion or did you guys just kind of skip over there? Or did anybody even notice the asterisk at the bottom, at the end of the word America? I didn't see it at the bottom because it's blurry where I, so I thought where it starts with the slave trade came through, I thought that was still part of the, <laughs> the story that he okay. was writing. Okay, yeah. Um, so that, that was, that's technically an end note. Um, but I'm gonna read that just in case anybody glossed over that because it's, it's, it's vastly important, the information that's in that end note. So it says, the slave trade came through the cramped doorway of the slave ship, leaving a wake like that of a crawling desert um, caravan. It may be drawn like this, and he gives you like this drawing, right? Um, it's a line with these three things coming out of each end of the line. Um, African countries to the east, the land of America to the west. This creature is in the image of a forbill. This is where it gets important. African languages become, became deterritorialized, thus contributing to the creolization in the West. So what do you guys think he means when he says that the African language became deterritorialized? What does that mean to you? I have a question. Yeah. Can you explain what deterritorialized means? Yeah. So what, is, what does it mean to, what is a territory? Let's, let's start there somewhere that somebody resides and they claim is their own. So if if we're talking about language, right? And we're talking about language being and belonging to a certain territory, okay? But what he's saying is that that language gets deterritorialized, right? So what do you think that means? So now from my understanding, it means that it no longer belongs to this one group of people or it travels outside of its home base, right? So how does language travel? What is the impetus that allows or the vehicle that allows language to travel? Literature. That's one way, what else? Verbally? Word of mouth. Word of mouth, so, okay, that, that works. How would a language how would a language travel, right? And think about the specificity of a certain language, right? So if a language is specified to a region and it's traveling, that means that there's a, a, a breach in translation, right? So how in that case would the language travel? Colonization. Uh, kinda, kinda, but more importantly, people right? When people travel, language travels with them, 
right? And this is what Glissant is getting at when he says the language becomes deterioralized, deter right? Because what is this, what is the text really talking about? If you kind of strip away all the metaphors, what is the, the impetus of the text? What experience is, what experience is Glissant describing? Enslavement. Enslavement, right? So that deterritorialization is, is manifested through Africans being kidnapped off of their native lands and then being transported to the Western Hemisphere, right? So when he talks about that deterritorialization, that is the kidnapping of Africans from their native soil and being brought to other parts of the world. And that's how the language gets deterritorialized. But then he says it leads to the creolization of the West. Right, so let's let's unpack what that means. Um, who has heard of, or who is somewhat familiar with Creole culture? Nobody. Um, who is familiar with New Orleans? Okay, Can, um, Jamie, what what do you know about New Orleans? Uh, I've been there before. It's really okay. pretty. Um, they have really good food. Um, uh, it's really festive over there. People wear like really like bright colors. I noticed. Uh, I went during Mardi Gras season, so okay. well, I was just about to say that. So right now yeah. we're entering into Mardi Gras season. I went the day after Mardi Gras. I went for a concert, but um, so and you mentioned the food, right? Mm -hmm. The food and the music are very large staples of um, New Orleans. Um, and one of the dishes that provides a great example of creolization is gumbo. Has anybody heard of gumbo? No. I've had it and it's freaking amazing. <laughs> Very good. Y'all um, missing out if you haven't had it. So J Jenna, can you describe like, you may not know how it's prepared, but can you describe what's in the dish? Basically there's like this really dark roux um, that they put in there. You have to make sure it's like, basically like super, super dark, like dark chocolate kind of dark. And there's like okra and then like the Holy Trinity of bell peppers, I think, uh, onions, and I think, I forgot the last one. <laughs> Celery. <laughs> Celery, thank you. And then, like, um, basically, like, you guys, like, they, they, uh, they mix it in, like, a little pot, and there's, like, stock or water, if you can't have stock, and um, sometimes you put, like, andouille sausages in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I'm getting hungry now just thinking about it. <laughs> uh, it's typically served with rice. Mm -hmm. and like it's so like flavorful and amazing yeah uh yeah so she's she's spot on right so what what's important though when it comes to the root is the spices right so if you if you're doing gumbo right you're gonna let the you'll pour you'll you'll, you'll let the spices sit in the root for a good 15 20 minutes right and, and the importance of that it allows the flavors from the spice to be infused into the root right then you'll pour in your um, sausages, you'll pour in your crabs, you'll pour in your shrimp, um, pour in whatever other meat that you want to add, um, the vegetables, of course, and then the rice. And you let this sit for about an hour. And what happens is as it sits, all those flavors begin to merge and it produces this one distinct flavor and, and what we you know, understand to be gumbo. So that could be understood as a process of creolization, right? So how this plays out in real time, if we're thinking about the experience that Glissant is, de is describing, right? You have people who are kidnapped from Ghana who may speak a Khan. You have people who are kidnapped from Nigeria who may speak Igbo. You have people who are kidnapped from Nigeria that may speak Hausa. You have people who are kidnapped from Nigeria who may speak um, Yoruba. You have people who are kidnapped from Senegal who may speak Wolof, right? So you have these myriad of African languages all being demarcated on a ship. On the ship and the individuals doing the kidnapping, they may be from, Sp from Spain, so they speak Spanish. They may be from France, so they speak French. They may be from um, Britain, so they speak English, right? So now you have not only the mixture of African languages, you have the mixture of languages from whoever's doing the, the capturing. Um, okay, y yeah, actually that's a, that's a good good point, um, Jeremy. I, I'm gonna get to that a little bit later because you're absolutely spot on. Um, and so what happens is 
not only do you have the mixing of African languages, you have the languages of the capturers, right? You also have wherever you're touched down and you're placed down at, right? So if you're in Americas, then you're there's, you know, you'll speak the English that's spoken in that particular region, right? So all of these things come together just like your gumbo, and it produces a new language, which you would call Creole, right? Another way to think about this, um, the Africans from the various parts of West Africa, um, they go through this experience that I described. They're placed in, in the area of known as Jamaica. They use all those mixings and they produce a culture called Jamaican culture. They produce a people called Jamaicans, right? Um, same group of people from Western Africa are snatched up and brought to Haiti, right? They mix all of these things together and they produce a culture called a Haitian culture. They produce a people called Haitians, right? This is this notion or this idea of creolization. So when you think about Santeria, um, Santeria, Corombe, um, Huru, Burum, right? These are religious or spiritual practices that are made out of the combining of ancient African spiritual traditions with the influx of, of Christianity, with the influx of um, Catholicism. And what they would do is they would take little bits and pieces of these uh, foreign religions, right? Catholicism and Christianity and incorporate them into their ancient or their indigenous spiritual system. So instead of, so you have your um, Catholic saints, right? So you don't do in African spiritual tradition, you don't have saints, you have what are called Orishas, right? And so what you would do is instead of um, praying to your Orisha, you will replace it with the saint. So that way the, the, the oppressor doesn't know that you're still practicing your indigenous religion and they think that you're praying to the God that they forced upon you, right? But through this mixing, you're producing this whole new religious system that, they, that we may know, now know as Santeria, right? So what is important for Glissant is the mixing that produces something new, right? And this is this notion or this idea of relation that becomes extremely important um, for Glissant and for understanding what he's up to within this text. Um, so also within this passage, right? So we know about how the language becomes deteriorized. Uh, we know about how the West gets Creole, um, is, is uh, contributing to Creolization. Um, but then he continues, right? This is the most completely known confrontation between the powers of the written word and the impulses of orality. Um, who does not know or who has not heard of orality before? Me. Okay, bet. So um, orality, it's just the, the ability to be oral, right? Uh, a rapper rapping over a beat is expressing or exhibiting orality. Um, a singer singing over a, on, on a song is orality, right? Me speaking to you in class and you speaking back to me is orality. So it's the ability to orate, right? It's the ability to use your um, words to get messages across. So he's saying that the most this is the most completely known confrontation between the powers of the written word and the impulse of orality. So again, the impulse of orality. This is why that be impulse becomes important. He continues to say, the only written thing on the slave ship was the account book listing the exchange values of slaves, right? So the ledger was the only written account, written document on the entire ship, okay? So what that ledger does, what that um, exchange value does, by and large, it symbolizes your inhumanity, right? Because if this number that was written on the paper next to your name is how much I paid for you, that is an indication of how much your life is worth, right? So then he also goes on to say, within the ship space, the cry of those deported was stifled as it would be in the realm of the plantation. So again, he's talking about a confrontation, right? Um, and we know that we have a written ledger that symbolizes the inhumanity of the individuals who were captured. And then he talks about this cry in the ship space that's stifled. What does it mean for a cry, for a cry to be stifled? Like not heard? not heard, to be, to be muted, to, to try to be covered up, right? 
So here's 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 our confrontation. Actually, before I get to there, excuse me. When a human being is experiencing torture, um, pain, um, physical abuse, what is the natural response when you're experiencing those things? Screaming, crying. To cry out, right? Yeah. So this is the confrontation. The desire to stifle the natural human response for pain and suffering juxtaposed to this ledger that symbolizes your humanity, right? So I have a, a book, an entity that says your value is $500, right? But when I beat you, you do the most human thing, which is to cry out, which represents your humanity. That mm -hmm. act alone symbolizes that you're a human being, right? So there's a conflict at play between you being my property and you trying to assert your humanity by crying. So we have to stifle that cry which is our confrontation that Lisan is talking about, okay? And then he says that this stifling will continue on the plantation, right? Then he goes on to say, this confrontation still reverberates to this day. Who could give me an example of how this confrontation still reverberates to this day? Uh, incarceration. Absolutely, that's a great example. Can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit more for me for us, Jeremy? Um, like the fact that black people are more likely to be sent to jails and they have to do labor there. Um, like here, they have to fight fires here and they get paid what, like 10 cents yeah. or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. Uh, risking their own lives for something. And then when they get out of jail, they can't even apply to become a firefighter afterwards as well. Absolutely. And, and to add on to that, right? Um, the only way that slavery is legalized within this country is how? How is slavery, slavery legal within this country? And Jeremy already kind of touched on it. It's in the Constitution. Go ahead, George. Uh, through the prison system? Through the prison system. So once you are an inmate, you are legally able to become a slave, right? So again, that, this confrontation continuing even to this day. Um, so again, going back to the abyss, right? He, he mentioned that there's three phases of the abyss. So for me, I'm like, what are those three phases? How does he articulate those three phases? Um, also the use of metaphor, um, the boat as a pregnant belly, right? Um, the, abu the, the abyss as a womb that swallows you up, right? So I'm attentive to how he's using those metaphors. Are those metaphors effective? Um, let's see. And then he makes this claim, right, that you're alone within your suffering, but then you're not alone in the suffering. Um, let's see. I'm, I'll, I'll read it for you. One second, let me locate it real quick. Actually, let me let me do this because we'll we'll um, we'll jump to this. So starting on page six, this paragraph here, um, starting with the next abyss. So again, we have the three stages of the abyss. We know the first stage of the abyss is the boat, and then Glisson goes on to say the next abyss was the depths of the sea. Whenever a fleet of ships gave chase to a slave ship, it was easiest to lighten the load by throwing cargo overboard weighing it down with balls and chains. These underwater signposts mark the course between the Gold Coast and the Leeward Islands. So what is the cargo that's being thrown overboard that Gleason is describing? The slaves? The Africans who were enslaved, right? And then, so not only are they thrown overboard, they're tied to balls and chains. So this is, becomes important because these people who are being thrown overboard are still alive, right? So they want to make sure that they are tied and they sink down to the bottom of the ocean. So they tie them with ball and chain, right? And he says these individuals who are way to the bottom of the ocean are signposts to give you a direction on how to navigate from the west coast of Africa to the western hemisphere. So if you think about, you know, if you're on the 10 freeway and you're going west, right? Um, and you'll have your exits, you'll have uh, Crenshaw, you'll have um, Vernon, you'll have um, La Brea, right? 
those are signposts to let you know when to exit and let you know if you're going west or let you know if you're going east, right? So what Gleason is saying, if you are to go to the bottom of the ocean, you will have literal signposts of human beings who were tied with ball and chain and forced at the bottom of the ocean that will allow you to navigate from the west coast of Africa to the western hemisphere, right? Um, so these are those signposts. And then, so that's the second metamorphosis of the abyss. And then the final metamorphosis of the abyss is he says, it's all that you leave behind you, right? So all that you are forced to forget, your customs, your languages, your spiritual practices, your foods, your families, all that was left behind you, that's the third process of the abyss, right? Which you're forced to forget. Um, Okay. And we'll, I'll end it with this. On page eight, the second to last paragraph, um, it starts with, for, for this experience made you, for though this experience made you, original victim floating towards the sea's abyss, an exception, it became something shared and made us. Now be attentive to the shift from singular to, to the plural, right? So he says, for this experience made you, right? Singular, original victim floating towards the sea's abyss, an exception, it became something shared and made us. So now it's a plural thing that he's describing, right? Us, the descendants, one people among others, People do not live on exception. Relation is not made up of things that are foreign, but of shared knowledge. I'm gonna read that again. Relation is not made up of things that are foreign, but of shared knowledge. This experience of the abyss can now be said to be the best element of exchange. So there's a lot going on in that little paragraph. One, as I pointed out earlier, the shift from a singular to plural. Um, and then two, relation is built from shared knowledge, right? So think about how I articulated the process of creolization, right? You have Africans from various parts of West Africa and throughout Africa uh, who are speaking various languages, right? It's very plausible if you think about it. If I'm from Ghana, right, and I speak a Khan, and I wake up and I'm on the ship, my feet are shackled, my hands are shackled together. Um, as I come to the consciousness of this is what, where my, what my state is, um, I realize that I'm chained to someone next to me, right? And as I try to figure out what's going on with me, it's natural to look at that individual next to you who's experiencing the same thing and try to communicate with that individual, right? But if I'm from Ghana and that individual is from Nigeria and they speak Igbo, we're not gonna be able to communicate, right? We speak different languages. But what is shared is the experience, right? So I can look at these chains on me and I can look at the chains on that other individual and we know we're both going through the same experience, right? Um, so through that six to eight month process of being in that ship, you're going to start to find ways to communicate, right? So maybe I'll learn the Igbo word for chain and you'll learn the Ghanaian word for boat or ship. And between that exchange, now we are starting to, do, to produce a dialogue, right? And what he's talking about, that's the experience, that's the shared knowledge that Glissant is talking about that produces and forges relations, right? So again, this idea of relation becomes centered focus for Glissant as it, as it pertains to what he's up to in this project. I mean, he names the whole book Poetics of Relation, right? Um, also think about our readings from last week on Ma'at. One of the purposes of Ma'at was to, the social order of things, right? What's important about that social order is how society relates to one another. So again, we have this notion or this idea of relation, right? So um, I'm going to end my notes there. We'll jump into our fishbowl. Um,
Is there anyone who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? I will. Alexis? So will uh, I. Me too. Uh, Kimberly? I heard somebody else. I didn't hear the other person. Uh, Jasmine? Jasmine, okay. Uh, me too. Uh, one second. Let me get the last one. I got Jasmine. And who was the last one? Uh, Jamie. Jamie. Okay. All right. So for our fishbowl today, we have Alexis, Kimberly, um, Jasmine, and Jamie. And I will shut up, and whoever wants to shut it off, it's on you. I can start. Okay. So the question that we were supposed to answer in our group was, why is poetry important? And you told us to look back at the last paragraph. And after rereading the last paragraph, my group, we came to the conclusion that in the beginning, the poet talks about how boats are bad and something to be feared of because in the experience, boats are what took them away from their family and boats is what gave them into the slave trade or took them to where they were supposed to go. But at the end, the last sentence reads, our boats are open and we sail them for everybody. So me and my group kind of took that as you have to change it into something positive if that's what you want to do. You have to, you have to, um, what's the right word? Basically, you just have to change it into something positive. And the same way that he mentions the abyss, in the, in the beginning, the abyss is something that's bad. It's something that you're supposed to fear. But after he keeps repeating the word over and over again, the abyss becomes something that's not supposed to be feared. It's supposed to be a new beginning that you see. Um, we also know, I mean, it's the same thing with the boats and especially how the poem is called the open boat, where it's just kind of connecting the lines. You have to be open to a new beginning. You can't be afraid of what's to come. That's a very good point, Alexis, but I would like to add on to that, right? Um, so she mentions that newness, right? Um, that newness could also be understood through relation. Because think about how I mentioned you have various different languages and they come together to produce Creole, right? Think about how you're taking all these ingredients together and they're blending them and they're gonna produce a dish called gumbo, right? That new, so with Glissant, while he's attentive to relation and his interest is relation, what he's really interested in is how relation produces newness, right? So. Alexis is really spot on in her assessment of how he shifts the boat to mean something different, how he shifts the abyss to mean something different. What Glissant is doing is he's taking this experience of enslavement and shifting it to produce something different, this idea of creolization, this idea of relation. So that's a very good point. Um, who's next? Um, I'll go. When okay. you were talking about Creo, it, it really reminded me of like the melting pot theory which is that like how um, cultures come together and like create this new culture in a sense. So it reminded me of that a lot. And I just thought that it went along with the text because he's basically saying that the people that survived were going into like this new world and they were still enslaved, but no matter what, like they were trying to get through it and um, just trying to get through it. And I feel like the poetry part of the text was important because it makes people like read in between the lines and gives the story like a way deeper meaning. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, who's next? Um, yeah, so when it was talking about the womb, I just kind of pictured like someone being pregnant in a way. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, in the womb, you really don't know like, oh, I, I don't, I like, of course, we don't know, like, what happened to the, well, we know, oh, you know what, ignore me, um, um, it's like, we don't, we, we don't have, like, the, the fetus in size doesn't really have the, the concept of time, so they also don't know what's going on, and in a way, they were also, those who were enslaved were also lost, they didn't know where they were going, especially the first people, and when they were pushed out, I would say, like, pushed out when they were, like, taken out and, like, pushed into slavery, um, they were kind of forced to be rebirthed, re reborn, mm -hmm. because they had they were stripped away from their identity. They were so they couldn't practice their religion anymore. They basically did not know the language, so they had to adapt as much as possible and like grow up in a sense. Or that's kind of how I just took it all. 
No, actually, Kimberly, you're, you're spot on. And, and I would like to link what you just said to what Alexis was saying, right? That newness. Yeah. That's exactly what you're talking about, right? You go into the boat one way, um, you go into the boat Akan, right? And you come out of the boat Jamaican, you know what I mean? So it's this newness that's being produced. So you're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, who's next? Um, so reading this poem, it kind of just like reminded me of like a movie I watched or something like in like 11th grade. So like this whole entire like poem just reminded me of it when as I was like reading it about like the boat, how like in the beginning it was like a really hard time for them and how like they were just going through such a difficult time in their life. And then at the end where it became like, um, like a new beginning for them. And that's, that's just what like it really reminded me of but i don't remember what the movie was called okay i was gonna i was gonna ask you that next like what, what's yeah, the yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember all good um but again this central theme or the central notion of a new beginning right but i, I do want to push back and i want to kind of problematize this idea that the new beginning is something by and large positive right so i'm, I'm gonna point us to page six uh the first full paragraph um starting with what is terrifying but i'm going to go down to the bottom and i'm going to start with although although you are alone in this suffering you share in the unknown with others again the move from the singular to the plural um alone sorry although you're alone in this suffering you share in the unknown with others whom you have yet to know this boat is your womb a matrix and yet it expels you this boat pregnant with as many dead as living under the sentence of death, right? That living under the sentence of death becomes important. Why and why does that become important? And what do you think he's saying within that? To me, I think of that as in like a uh, living under sentence of death seems like they're lack uh, they're they're not going to be free once they reach the Americas so like they're as soon as they get in the ship they're basically quote unquote dead yeah absolutely spot on so while there is a newness that takes place right it doesn't necessarily mean a positive experience for those who were captured right you're still living under the, the promise of, or the sentence of death right once you made it through the three abysses of the boat the ocean um, and which you left behind you're still within the abyss of the Americas, of the Caribbean, or whatever plantation that you land on, and all the atrocities that that plantation can inflict on you, right? So while you are all are correct in the sense of being aware of the newness that's produced, let's not confuse or conflate that newness with, you know, having their lives back, right? Um, they had to fight tooth and nail to get any bit of humanity that, you know, they were able to obtain. Um, so great job, you guys, on the fishbowl. Um, I think you guys made some very salient points. Uh, what we'll do for the last 15 minutes or so of, court, of the course is we'll open it up to class conversation. Um, I, I would love to hear from those who have not commented on what your thoughts of, were the, of the readings were. Um, you could start, we'll start the conversation by addressing what was discussed in the breakout room, right? Why does this poetic method become important for Gleason? And you could share what was discussed in your uh, breakout groups, or you could just kind of speak what your, what's on your mind as a state as it is now. So again, why does the poetic method for Glissant become important? Um, one thing that my group had talked about for why the poetic, um, like using the poetic way to write it was kind of important is it makes the reader as opposed to just like reading a large chunk of text that is nothing but lists a bunch of facts by adding in the poetic language, it makes you not only kind of visualize what you're reading in a different way, but you also have to think more critically about what you're reading to understand what the author is trying to say and convey to the reader. And it makes it, for lack of a better word, not be like as boring as it may be for some people to just read a bunch of straight facts. It adds in some imagery and some other aspects that kind of drive you into it a little more and see it in a different light that you would as opposed to just reading it straight out of a textbook. Yeah, that's a very good point, Alyssa. 
Um, and, and another thing that you, which you said made me think about. So um, this poetic was about what, five or six pages? Um, and it describes a very horrific experience, right? Um, if you are look back in the black literary tradition, um, this experience has been articulated several times, um, specifically within the framework of the autobiography, right? And one of the most famous autobiographies depicting the enslaved experience was that of Frederick Douglass. Now, I, I could be wrong, but if my memory serves me correctly, the autobiography of Frederick Douglass is anywhere from 300 to 400 pages, right? So what Glissant was able to effectively do is capture what took what it took Frederick Douglass 400 pages to write within five to six pages because of his use of imagery, right? Um, because of his use of visualization, right? Because of the poetic method allowed him to be a lot more flexible and manipulative with the English language. He was able to get just as much done with a lot less um, page space, right? Who else? Who else could add as to why the poetic becomes becomes important. Um, I think it becomes important because it allows to like build associations, like, mm -hmm. um, and it's like a form, like in a way, like storytelling, like what I might perceive as something um, positive, somebody else might perceive as negative, and then you can get a deeper understanding of somebody else's perspective. I like that uh, association. That's a, that's a great. Um, great term for what's taking place here. Um, so let me shift the conversation a little bit and kind of provoke you into this thought. Um, so if you think about the first component of your journal, you're gonna articulate what the author's thesis was or what the author's argument was. You're gonna articulate also, how does the author go about articulating their thesis, right? Another way to talk about that how is the method. So we know that in this text, the poetic Glissant used was, uh, sorry, the method Glissant used was a poetic, right? So now the question I have for you is, as a reader, your personal opinion, did you find the poetic method to be effective, um, ineffective, and why? I think with what everyone else was saying, it, it makes it more effective because it really makes you think more critically about what's being said um, and understanding the imagery of, of the way it's written. Um, it makes it more visual, which is easier for a lot of people to understand. Um, like even there is this one quote that said like white wind of the abyss and it kind of reminds me of like, the white people who were enslaving Africans and then pulling them and like pushing them towards enslavement to the Americas. Um, and that's just like one small snippet mm -hmm. of six pages. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, I forgot who said it. Uh, shit, I had a thought. Mm. There it was. Um, I think it was Alexis, and she was saying how how the uh, the poetic ends, right? Uh, our boats are open, and we sell them for everyone. So this is a component of the Black radical radical tradition. Um, this is the component of really Black womanism thought, um, and really how Black folks have historically approached activism, right? Um, so. It's with the understanding that although we may do things that will promote and ensure our freedom as African people, to do so lifts up everyone who's oppressed as well, right? Um, if you think about the hierarchy of oppression in this country, right? It's the old adage, if you're white, you are right. If you yellow, you mellow. If you brown, you down. If you black, get back, right? So it talks about this, the hierarchy, the racial hierarchy in this country. Um, using that adage, you know that the black folks or those who are considered to be black are at the bottom of that totem pole, right? So if you improve the situation for those who are at the bottom of the totem pole, everyone else above them on that hierarchy, their situations will improve also, right? 
So that is at play in the last line of the poetic, right? We're now selling these boats for everyone, right? And, and we're selling them, of course, to improve our situation, to ensure our freedom. But we are aware of the fact that in doing so, everyone's situation will get better. And I think you saw, you'll find the personification of that in the work of um, Stacey Abrams, right? And which she did with the state of Georgia. Why would I say that Stacey, Stacey Abrams, excuse me, is the personification of that more modality in the black radical tradition? First of all, who, who is Stacey Abrams? Well, if it's, I, I could be getting ahead of myself. Who have anybody familiar with the work of Stacey Abrams? Okay. So Stacey Abrams is a black woman. Um, she's a politician. I don't know exactly what form of politician she is, um, but she's in the state of Georgia, right? By and large, Georgia is a Republican state. Um, the last term of elections, she was beat, I, I'm gonna say beat with air quotes. Um, really, she was cheated out of her, um, out of her electoral position um, through voter suppression. Um, the most recent one, she also did not win, right? But though she lost her personal position, she went on a campaign to flip the state of Georgia from a Republican state to a Democratic state, right? So that's not going to personally ensure her role in politics, but she recognized to do so will be instrumental in removing 45 out of office, right? So she engaged in work that will benefit the collective whole, right? As a black woman, she understood that it's important for me to do this so I can improve the whole of society, right? So that's, in, that's reflected in this idea of the boats being sailed for everyone, right? We're gonna do work that yes, will benefit us, but we're doing it with the understanding that it will benefit all, right? So to me, that's why when, um, you talk about black power, right, is vastly distinctive and it's vastly antithetical to what white power is, right? Why, why would I say that? Make, make that make sense. Why would I say that black power is vastly different from white power, even antithetical to black to white power? Um, because black power includes the collective. Um, whereas white power seems very um, individualistic, I guess is the word I'm trying to look for. White power was created to combat the idea of black power. Therefore, they they're, like they're. Uh, oh, give me a second. I'm trying to collect my thoughts. All right. So like, white power was literally made to diminish the black power movement. It's like a counterattack. Yes, but. From a genealogical standpoint, like white power would really predate the Black Power movement. By and large, the Black Power movement kind of took took effect in the late '60s, mid to late '60s to the '70s. Whereas you could trace, um, for example, the Ku Klux Klan um, back to the 1920s, the 1930s. So, um, from the organizational iteration, right? It, it's um, white power would, would predate black power. I would even flip your statement, Jana, and say that black power is a counter to white power, right? Um, but another way to think about this, answering this question, is thinking about the organizations, right? Um, so most notoriously, who espouses white power is the Ku Klux Klan, right? And these white supremacist organizations. Think about the work that they do, right? Um, the most famous organization to espouse Black power would be the Black Panther Party, right? Think about, especially in Chicago, and, and right now there's a movie out, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, that deals with Fred Hampton. But what, and I, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know if they speak to this or not, but really what got Fred Hampton caught up was he was organizing the Latin Kings, a large gang in, in Chicago, and he was organizing um, the poor white folks in Chicago. And they were building coalitions and solidarity, right? So again, he was all about, um, did you touch on it? Okay, bet. Um, so he was definitely about black power, right? He was unapologetic about his need for black power, but 
he did it in a way that was inclusive to all marginalized groups, right? Even a group that would be subversive to black power, white folks, right? They had the wherewithal to say, although y'all white, you're poor. So you don't even get to enjoy the benefits of your whiteness, right? So that is a, a reason for you to get in line with us and let's overthrow the system of oppression that's oppressing even you from an economic standpoint, right? So again, this notion of um, when we, and I say we, I'm talking about African people, when we engage in these political struggles, we do it with the mind state of improving all of humanity, all of the collective whole. Also a very large component of um, black womenist praxis, right? Um, to organize around the collective whole. Um, even when you think about how um, black feminists and black women is practice manifest itself, right? You look at organizations like Black Lives Matter, it doesn't have a um, single figure as the sole leader, right? They are operating under a group centered leadership model, right? Where the collective are, are the leaders. So that way you don't have one person to take out and the movement dies, right? You have to deal with the whole collective. Um, what Cydia Hartman may call the chorus or the swarm, right? Um, last, give me two more questions or concerns or comments about the reading and we'll call it a day. Preferably from somebody we haven't heard of, heard from, excuse me. So Fatima, what was your uh, thoughts on the reading? Adam, are you there? Alexander, what were your thoughts on the reading? My thoughts on the reading? Yeah. Oh, uh, it was you. when I was I thought I like, had like, had like more to it. It's on the background perspective, like if you read, if you were to read, like it means it just had like it was into depth. Yeah, we had to like, it was like more to understand like how I was talking about how the slaves were being brought here with their language and how it was taken away and stuff like that. So it was like it was to me it caught my attention just knowing how it could have been. Uh, how can how can I explain like like how they like I was I was comparing it to us when when like when Mexican culture was brought here, like it was taking part of it away. So that's why I felt like it was with the slaves, like their culture was being taken away from them. Yeah. But I go from there. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good point. And, and it's a great comparative analysis, right? So what he's saying is um, he compared it to the indigenous spirit experience on this land, right? Um, if you think about the missions, the missions was a violent institution that beat the indigenousness out of those individuals to make them American, right? You couldn't speak your indigenous language. You couldn't wear your indigenous clothes, right? You had to speak English. You had to dress like an English, right? Yeah. Again, um, keep in mind, y'all, like think about the first week of our class, right? Think about what was covered in that first week. We talked about Imhotep. We talked about Mansa Musa. We talked about Taharka, right? These individuals weren't slaves, right? These were people who were doing things, right? These were actual agents who had agency and were actual individuals, right? These were brilliant individuals. So there were no slaves um, took into the Americas, right? They were African people who were kidnapped and placed into the experience of enslavement, right? So at best, we have enslaved Africans or we have individuals were, who were enslaved. We had no, we weren't, we're not dealing, nor are we talking about slaves, right? We're talking about individuals and people who experience slavery. So we have to be very mindful with our words and our terminology, um, just like the word minority, right? Think about who makes up minority, black folks, indigenous folks, folks with, from the, um, with Asian, Asian descent, right? So these are three subgroups I just named. And all of those subgroups make up minorities, right? If you put all of those individuals, all of those subgroups together, it's going to be more of the so-called minorities than the people who we identify as a majority, right? So the only individuals who get classified as a majority is white folks, right? So we have three subgroups 
who are considered a minority and one subgroup who's considered the majority. Mathematically, that does not make sense, right? So we have to be very strategic and meticulous with our words to kind of wash off the colonizing of our mind that has taken place by living within the society for all this time. Um, thank you, Alexander. Let's get one more point and we'll call it a day. So we haven't heard from Kim, we haven't heard from Valeria, we haven't heard from Liliana. Um, Fatima is MIA. Uh, we haven't heard from Asmerelda. And I don't think we heard from Nicole. So either one of you would like to end it up, end it off for us. Um, well, I think that the reading pretty much talks about how, even though um, we're, the, um, how would I put it? Uh, like there's division, but in that division, there's like, um, there's a home where everyone can come and create a community and how we can like come together and support each other, even through the most difficult times. Absolutely. And that's the relation that Gleason is trying to get us to be attentive to. Uh, very good point. Um, so let me pull up our Google Classroom site real quick so that way I can show you what our readings for next week are. Bear with me one second. Okay. All right, so for next week, uh, we'll be reading Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, um, Chapter 10, The Commercial Part of the Nation and Slavery. Um, so that's what we'll be reading for next week. And again, it's just one PDF, um, Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, uh, Chapter 10. So that will be for next week's reading. Is there any last minute questions?